Hi there, Juleika here. Before we get started, I want to invite you, yes, you, to be a guest on the show. If you're an adult and a child of immigrants, and they could be from anywhere in the world, really, I'd love to talk to you about the conversations that are necessary but challenging, especially right about now. So whatever you're all getting into, I want to know about it. Politics, money, holidays, marriage, kids, everything. So send me an email directly at juleika at lantiguawilliams.com and we'll get you on the show. I can't wait to hear from you. Hi, everybody. Today, we welcome Natalie. She's a Dominican-American woman who is really aware of how some of her experiences growing up at home are impacting her life as an adult. But she struggles to talk to her mom about it in an open and vulnerable way. Let's get into it. I'm Natalie Peña. I use she, her, Aja pronouns. I am from Washington Heights, aka Little Dominican Republic in New York City. And growing up, I called my mom and dad Mommy and Papi. I was a very shy and super introverted kind of a loner child. And I still very much am that kind of person. As a child, I was very on my own, like always reading a book. Um, I had a very difficult time getting close to people, even if it was somebody like my mom. I never really like took advantage of having her always nearby to like talk about like my feelings or like, you know, things that I was going through in school because I wasn't really a person that like to share my emotions too much. Recently, I was hanging out with my mom at a Chipotle of all places, just having lunch, you know, gossiping about family things. We were talking about a specific group of relatives and their parent-child relationship. And it made me think about intergenerational trauma and how your race really shapes who you are. She kind of disagreed a little bit or didn't really understand like what that really meant. She kind of laughed about it. And not that I have personal experience with physical trauma, but I think everybody has some sort of like Our personalities, again, are shaped by how we're raised. So I just brought up to my mom, like, oh, you know, there were things that you said growing up that honestly affected how I look at things. For example, I always remember her saying, like, I don't have money for this. I don't have money for that, all that stuff. So I always grew up with a fear of not never being able to have enough. I'm scared of making too much money. Like, what do I do with it? I'm scared of not having enough. Like, it was kind of like, a huge battle. So I mentioned that to her. And again, she was kind of being defensive. Oh, you know, I didn't really like say it that way. I was very specific with things that I couldn't afford. I tried my best, all of those things. And I was like, yeah, for sure. I completely agree. But I want you to know that the things you say have left a dent in my life. And this is how it's happened. And then, yeah, kind of similar to maybe a lot of other people is like growing up with a single mom and like experiencing a parent leaving has kind of amplified my need for structure. Another thing that comes to mind is I never, I've never really seen my parents be emotional, like cry or anything. And I would cry very easily. And I've always kind of seen it as a really bad thing to do. And I would always kind of beat myself up for it. Even to this day, I have a tough time like expressing my feelings and I avoid certain conversations because I know it might end up leading me to cry and things like that. I've always felt like I didn't fit in with my mom's side of the family specifically because I felt different. I was I was always the person like at like house parties like with my family that wouldn't dance and I would just kind of be in the corner just watching and observing things. Um And because my mom is such a, like, you know, has a childlike spirit and is, like, always laughing, she would laugh about it. And I would kind of feel, oh, she's laughing at me, like I'm doing the wrong thing, kind of. Like, I should be more like her. Now, looking at it, I'm wondering if 
I was just trying to be like kind of a balance in the family or for my mom and like our relationship. Sometimes I feel like I parent her in a way. I brought had brought that up to her and she was kind of confused about it. She mentioned like, oh, but you can't just blame it all on me. Like, you know, also you had Papi there. Like he probably did stuff too. I was like, oh yeah, I'm not putting the blame on you. I kind of was getting a little heated with her at that point. Cause I was like, I'm not telling you this for you to validate my feelings. I'm just trying to express to you like, this is how I feel. Well, she thanked me for expressing my feelings because she said, um, you've never opened up to me before about those specific things. I know who you are as a person and I know these types of things are difficult for you. Her telling me that it made me feel really good. And I was like, oh, wow, like I can actually do this with her and maybe I can try it with other people in my family. I think she also holds things in. So I wonder who she has to talk things about. And I think about that every once in a while, but I haven't like kind of worked up the courage to be vulnerable again, to be like, hey, like, you know, I'm here to talk with you about whatever you want. Like, are you actually okay? And sometimes I think it is too late. I'm like, why am I starting this now? But even just having that one conversation, opening up a little bit, reminded me like this can actually feel good. If you love our show, then you love Adventure in Atacama. In this comedy adventure game, you get to help Mariela, a Mexican-American flight attendant, find her missing mother and save the world from the Atacama effect. Adventure in Atacama allows you to choose the story path you want the episode to end on. Start playing the game right now on chooseyourpodcastadventure.com and search for Adventure in Atacama on your favorite podcast app. The entire show is also available in Spanish under the title Azafata en Atacama at chooseyourpodcastadventure.com backslash ES. Wherever you're listening to us right now, find Adventure in Atacama and enjoy the game. Juleka here. I'm so excited to tell you about LWC Studios new show, How to Talk to High Achievers About Anything. We'll hear from Black and brown professionals who have reached levels of excellence that sometimes come with great personal and professional challenges. People who are looking for ways to keep leveling up. In 15-minute bi-weekly episodes, host Stevan Lewis, a licensed psychotherapist and coach, offers feedback and strategies on a range of topics, like the pressures of being an entrepreneur, the struggle to stay motivated, and the cost of fitting in. With empathy, candor, and a penchant for spot-on analogies, Stevan helps all of us high achievers navigate obstacles and figure out how to define success in our own terms. Here's the trailer for how to talk to high achievers about anything. The first episode drops April 4th. What's up, everybody? I'm Stevan Lewis, a licensed psychotherapist. I specialize in working with individuals who reach levels of excellence that often come with great personal and professional challenges. I'm hosting a new show from LWC Studios called How to Talk to High Achievers About Anything. We'll hear stories from individuals striving to do big things. Who do I think I am to think that I could, also being a woman, also being Black, get in this industry and be in this industry and be able to support myself in this industry? People who are facing roadblocks. You know, when you keep getting the door closed, it's like, what is it about me? And who, just like you and I, are facing challenges from others and from within ourselves. I'm a high achiever. Things are supposed to come easy for me. And if this is hard, then maybe it's not my lane. I'll offer feedback and strategies so that together, we can all figure out how to achieve on our own terms. Subscribe or follow How to Talk to High Achievers About Anything from LWC Studios. And connect with us on Twitter at Talk to Achievers. Oof. As a Dominican-American woman, I really relate to Natalie's story. Conversations around our upbringing, about the legacy of our experiences, and the traumas that we've all experienced can be extremely difficult to tackle, even more so if we try to talk to our parents about it. As I listened to Natalie giving it a go with her mom, 
I felt really proud of her. I was silently cheering her on. Her experience made me wonder about what we as first gens can do to engage with our loved ones around these deeply rooted issues, especially when we want to be open and vulnerable. And that's not always the norm in our families. So to help us figure it out, I did what I always do. I called in an expert. I'm Dr. Lucette Sanchez. My pronouns are she, her, ella, and I'm a licensed psychologist. I specialize in working with BIPOC and first-gen professionals by my practice, which I named Calathea Wellness Coaching and Psychological Services. Calathea is a plant variety that symbolizes new beginnings, which is why it's so special for me to name it after these plants, because it really represents the communities that I want to work with. When you listened to Natalie's story, what did you hear? First, I thought it was incredibly powerful how vulnerable she was willing to be around her her mother. What I heard in a lot of what she was sharing is a lot of intergenerational trauma and cycles. I heard a lot of power, hearing her really work hard to reclaim her voice by trying to understand her thinking patterns and her relationships, right? Her relationship with money, her relationship with her family, her relationship as she approaches new experiences and and what that means for her. Take me through what the patterns are that you identified listening to her testimonial. One is a big pattern around silence. She spoke about how it is a challenge for her to begin to be more expressive and to really find her voice. And she identified as someone who's always been really introverted. But she also spoke on how she's learning to talk about her emotions and really finding her voice in that and highlights how her mother, in her perception, she didn't really recognize her mother having that support or having a space where she can talk about her feelings. So that would be one big pattern. The other one I briefly mentioned earlier is that relationship with finances. And this is really common in a lot of children of immigrants where there's a different relationship around, you know, the, the value of money, what it means to an individual, and how how we navigate it. There's something that often happens that I refer to and is commonly known as, as a scarcity mindset. You don't ever feel like you'll have enough. And so even when you're making a lot of money, there's always this fear of, you know, how am I going to afford my bills? How am I going to pay this if I give myself an extra luxury? And so that's when I bring up the trauma around money, the trauma around the silence. And uh, she also mentioned a lot around the different family dynamic with her father exiting the family and what it was like to then be raised by a single parent. And so what I love about how she speaks about her upbringing is how much insight she has into how it's impacted her. And so that's another way that she's breaking these different cycles by just even having that insight and awareness and recognizing because this happened to me, I'm somebody who benefits from having a lot more structure in my life. And by creating this structure, I'm challenging the narrative and I'm challenging these patterns of feeling stuck because I am in control. All right. So I'm going to ask you a question that probably requires a book length answer, but I, I want you to give it your best shot. And I recognize that coming into the question, we are becoming quite accustomed to using the word trauma, and uh, it's appropriate in many, many instances. But many of us, myself included, who grew up in the cohort, the pre-1990s immigrants, we thought of our trauma as values, as core experiences that shaped us, as things that defined who we are. Can you give us just a very cursory explanation of when something crosses over from being a value that you saw exhibited to being a trauma that creates some sort of a foundational rift in who you are and how you go out into the world from that family. Yeah. Thank you, Julika. That's a really good question. And and you're right. It's something that requires a much more in-depth explanation, but I will try to answer it with an example. When we talk about values and trauma, a common value would be respeto, right? Or respecting specifically our elders. And the reason that I bring this up when we're talking about trauma is that at times what this can lead to is further silencing, right? You have a negative interaction with a family member, 
maybe an elder, where they maybe disrespect your boundary in some way. A boundary could be as small as, you know, I, I just don't want to go dance. Uh, but your elders are like, no, you got to get going, you know, am I lad? Like, let's get it. And uh, in that moment, your values are in a direct conflict because you're like, oh, but I want to respect this person. But your needs then, like you want to respect someone, but then your needs are not being met because your needs are that you don't want to dance. You don't want to do that, right? And so while this is a very uh, simple example, what happens is that then the individual will then will try to accommodate so much that then they start to be more of people pleasing or they'll start doing more for others and stop really paying attention to their own needs. How I view this as trauma is because it, it, it then impacts your sense of self and your mental health, right? Because in your mind, whether or not you're aware of it, your sense of self-worth is based on how much you serve others, not how much your needs are being met. That's a really good example. And I can see that there is a scale from the value of let's respect our elders to the behavior of, no, you have to dance because otherwise I'm going to take offense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's another easy question for you. How can we begin to, for ourselves, establish that difference, right, between something that was useful and helpful, like a value, a good example, a tradition maybe, to something that actually we have to accept as having been hurtful? What are the signs? What are the tells? You know, what, what's hard about, about this work is that sometimes when it's become our, our norm, we're not aware of how much harm it's causing to us. Let me think to, back to the example that I gave, right? You start noticing you have unexplained headaches every time someone invites you to a party <laughs> or stomach aches. And you may not be able to explain why. Why is it every time I get invited to another fiesta? Like, I'm, I get, feel sick. I feel sick, right? So that could be anxiety or depression symptoms that are manifesting physically, right? So those ones are, are really common for people to experience, but not so common to be labeled as mental health. You know, what's more common are the, the nervios, right? Feeling a little bit anxious, your increased heart rate, constantly spiraling in your thoughts about how many times am I going to be asked to do this? planning in your mind how to escape, right? How to get out of the, of the situation that's causing you stress. Uh, those, are, I guess, are some ways that you can begin to identify that you're experiencing this uh, on, a, on a smaller level, right? Because sometimes we don't notice it until, until we have an outburst, until you're sitting there and all of a sudden you start yelling and you're like, why am I yelling? This person just asked me to dance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I feel that so deeply. Um, I'm an introvert, which nobody believes me. But when I get an invitation to something, I like everything tenses up. And it often ends up being something that I do actually do, you know. But still, that initial, uh, you know, is, is very real. That, that very visceral response. Yeah, and it's important to to notice that, right? Like you you recognize I'm an introvert. This is part of my identity. I will I will always sort of feel like this, and then I will assess and decide: is this something I want to do and move forward with, right? And and, and that's the step that sometimes we we or individuals maybe feel that they don't have because of how they've been conditioned to feel like they have no voice or they have no choice or that isn't an option that they have. And I think it's really common. When there's a, the value of, you know, the, this responsibility and these obligations to la familia. This is actually a perfect segue into my next question. And I ask this of our experts all the time because it's a line that keeps moving. And the question is simply, what responsibility does someone like Natalie, a first gen who's working through her stuff, what responsibility does she have to help her mom work through her stuff? And is that helpful as we're working through our stuff? Or should those two things happen separately in the chronology? So <laughs> this is also a really hard question because what responsibility do we have? What do we owe to anyone, right? But I also highlight how subjective it is for individuals because when, you know, people listen, they'll be like, oh, this is what I have to do. Oh, no, 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 no. We are very clear that this is not a do this <laughs> kind of show. This is a consider. Yes, consider, have some options. Right. And so, so first is really reflecting on, you know, how much of this, is actually my responsibility. Initially, when I work with folks, you know, 
it can therapy can be really individualistic and it can feel like you're betraying family selfish. and selfish. Absolutely. In my work, what I really try to do is challenge folks to recognize that that individual focus, while it may feel really selfish, it is community healing. Because when you are healed, when you are able to respond instead of react, right? When you are able to pause, when you are feeling triggered, instead of automatically go to that anger response or that crying response or feeling like a victim in that moment, that creates so many changes for the people around you. If I was to say, here are some considerations for how to heal and how to uh, navigate healing for yourself and your family or for the others, I would recommend starting with you. Are there sort of like deal breakers? Like, are there things where when you talk to your clients, you're just like, "Mm, I don't know that you can get past this. I don't know that this is something you should forgive. I don't know that... You should put in the work that it's going to require for this because this person is just beyond redemption as far as their place in your life is. And what are those sort of like red flags for things like that? With any relationship, both people have to be committed to wanting to change or to grow. We see this in couples. We see this in friendships. We see this in siblings. If only one person is trying to resolve the problem, you're talking to a wall. Nothing is going to uh, change in that moment. But that doesn't mean that nothing will ever change. In my work, we have something that's called stages of change uh, when someone is ready. And sometimes people are in the pre-contemplative stage when they're just thinking about whether they're ready for a change or not. You want someone to be in more in the action stage for that. So what this looks like for individuals like with families, if you find that you set a boundary and you set a boundary and you set a boundary and it's continuously disrespected, You have to find a different way to set this boundary for yourself. You know, if I live 20 minutes away from my mom, she shows up at my place every night for dinner. And while I would enjoy that food every day and love it, I need some boundaries and space. So if she can't respect that and this is a relationship that's important for me to maintain, then instead I will look and see what are my other options. Maybe that means moving a little bit further away. Maybe that means not letting her have an extra key. (laughs) Like there's a lot of different steps along the way. But I wouldn't say that there's a hard red flag for anything because everyone has such a different capacity for forgiveness. And that really depends on how much pain an individual caused you and how much willingness you have to forgive them. But that varies individual by individual. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Please come back. All right. Here's what we learned from Dr. Lisette today. Notice on helpful patterns. The first step to breaking a negative cycle is self-awareness. This will help you pause before reacting and realize you have a voice and a choice. Recognize early triggers. These emotional, mental, and even physical reactions can be helpful signals that your values are conflicting with your needs. And remember, start with you. Working on yourself by going to therapy and prioritizing your own healing is not selfish. In fact, it's a necessary step for community healing. Thank you, as always, for listening and for sharing us. How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything is an original production of LWC Studios. Virginia Lora is the show's producer. Kojin Tashiro is our mixer. Manola Bedoya is our marketing lead. I'm the creator, Julie Galantigua. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Talk to Mommy Papi. Bye, everybody. Same place next week.